The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming in to him. And he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the first among you, who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Women, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. The Gospel of the Lord. So I'd like you all to just imagine for a moment that you're in a dark tunnel and you're realizing you're standing on a train track. You hear the sound of the train and you see the light coming towards you. There's no time to turn back and the walls of the tunnel are pressed up against the track. You can't get out and the train is coming. No, this isn't the ep opening to an episode of The Twilight Zone. But I think something similar was happening in the mind of the woman that we heard about in today's gospel. This woman is caught in the act of adultery, and she cannot escape. In Jewish law, the three gravest sins were murder, idolatry, and adultery, and all three were punishable by death. Death by stoning would be her sentence. She knows this, and we have to assume that she is very afraid. Maybe she is wishing she had a second chance. The cruelty of the Pharisees must be terrible for her. They really don't care about her at all. They just want to trap Jesus. But worst of all is the shame that she is feeling. All her neighbors are there to witness this. Now we've all sinned, and we've all experienced the shame that comes with sin. That burning desire to crawl into the ground and just disappear. Imagine how great hers was that day. But Jesus was not there to condemn her. She looks at, he looks at her and sees what St. Paul says in Ephesians, you are God's masterpiece. St. John Paul II once said, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. No, we are the son, sum of the Father's love for us, the real capacity to become the image of his son. When we meet that love in Jesus, it moves us to change our response. This is why the, Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. We are all called to a new relationship with God. We come as sinners and we, live as, we leave as forgiven. God is with us. Christ heals us. He fills us with joy and challenges us to become saints. Go and sin no more. Last week, my wife Terry and I watched the movie Unplanned, the story of Abby Johnson. It is a story of a college-age woman that had grown up in a Christian family who begins to volunteer for Planned Parenthood and would later become Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year as director of that facility. She had a conversion of heart when she stood watching through an ultrasound a 13-week-old unborn baby struggle and lose its life within its mother's womb. I will not go into the details of the film, 
But her view about the evils of abortion was forever changed in that moment. In the movie, it shows her locked, locking herself into a restroom and crying hysterically. After being involved with Planned Parenthood for eight years, she didn't know how she could be forgiven after the realization of being involved in 22,000 abortions and two of her own. In her book, The Walls Are Talking, Abby says she identifies with Mary Magdalene. She writes, I have done my fair share of sinning, and I've also been forgiven much more than I deserve. I abused and betrayed women in the worst possible way. I convinced them to kill their children. But it was Christ who changed me. If you haven't seen this movie, I highly recommend you to do, this, do so. But just like the woman accused of adultery we read about today, Abby encountered Christ and it changed her life. But when Christ says, go and sin no more, what does that mean for our lives today? God wants us to accept his love and the truth of who we are in the valley of humility. And there's no more profound encounter with God's mercy than through the sacrament of reconciliation. I would like us to consider two amazing things that happen in this sacrament. First, we are freed. God wants to free us from our sins and all the uneasiness and the guilt and the shame we might experience over what we have done. When we are truly sorry for our sins, God sees our contrite heart. God is not sitting back angrily pointing at his finger and condemning us for our sins. He is like the father we heard about in last week's gospel, racing out to meet his son. Love makes him want to remove whatever obstacles keep him from being reunited with his son. There's a famous short story from Ernest Hemingway of a father and his son who became estranged. They had had an argument and the son ran away. A few days later, the father set off to find him. He searched for months and could not find him. Finally, in a last ditch effort to find him, the father put an advertisement in the most important newspaper in Madrid. The ad read, Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all Pacos. Our hearts have been wounded by sin. We need to experience God's mercy, his forgiveness, his love over and over again in the sacrament in order to heal those wounds. That's the God we meet <clears throat> in the sacrament of reconciliation. How liberating it is to hear the words by the priest, I absolve you of your sins. So no matter what we have done, no matter how, time, how many times we have done it, and no matter how long it's been, know that Jesus is waiting for us in the sacrament of reconciliation. As Father Mo told us last week, there is no sin greater than God's mercy. Our God longs to lift the burden of our sins and give us a new start in life, like the woman in today's gospel. But there is more in the sacrament. There is a second amazing thing that God wants to do for our souls in confession. He doesn't just want to forgive us. He wants to heal us. God doesn't want to pardon us like a judge. He wants to heal us like a doctor. He wants to get to the root of our sin and cure us of our spiritual illness and wounds. He wants us to experience real change. And in the sacrament of reconciliation, God gives us the graces to avoid those sins in the future. In the sacrament of reconciliation, we receive an increase of the spiritual strength to go through our Christian battle. This is an amazing grace. If we want to grow as true disciples, if we want to ac access God's power to heal our weaknesses, to overcome bad habits and avoid following into the same, we should go to confession often. But we don't want to treat confession like the dry cleaner. When I get a stain on my suit, I take it to the dry cleaner. The dry cleaner removes the stain and the suit looks like new again. Sometimes we can approach confession the same way. We take our sins to confession, our God forgives us and removes the stain of sin and we are forgiven. But our sins are not merely a stain on our soul that need to be wiped away. 
Our sins leave us with a deep wound. They forge bad habits and patterns of life that make it difficult for us to love God more fully. Confession is an opportunity to begin anew, to go and sin no more. It's an invitation to a new way of life. Lent is the time the church gives us to enter into that new way of life. Let's make the most of the remainder of the Lent to do so. When our sins are forgiven, it's an invitation to live differently. One practical result that it brings us to forgive others in our own lives. It's easy to hold on to grudges in our hearts when someone hurts us, but through Christ's power and graces, we can truly forgive them. So when we receive Christ in the Eucharist today, let us ask him to help us to forgive, and we will begin to experience the peace and the mercy of God that goes beyond what we can imagine. Christ forgives us. He lifts us up, and he tells us, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. We need to allow his mercy to flow over us. Our God is mercy who calls us to change.